जनरल नारायणन कमांडेंट एम सी एम ई एयर मार्शल नामदेश्वर तिवारी डेप्टी चीफ ऑफ एयर स्टाफ कैप्टन अमित कर्ण कुबेर जनरल चंद्रन जनरल ओहरी जनरल ओबरॉय एयर वाइस मार्शल दीक्षित डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर्स officers from the army navy and the air force uh, joining us from various locations participants from the drdo uh, from academia ladies and gentlemen so it gives me great pleasure this morning uh, to welcome all of you uh, to this webinar on military training and uh, simulators now this this issue of simulator though they've been around for quite a few years but it has taken center stage um, and if i may call these times as covid times this issue of training with realism using uh, computer based tools and simulators took center stage in the last couple of years and uh, training is an abiding commitment it's a command responsibility both at the individual level and the collective level and the traditional paradigm uh, very elaborate uh, planning procedures locales timings programs everything is decided to attend to this uh, uh, commitment so that we are prepared 24/7 for any eventuality um, but as we are all aware that increasingly uh, the locations availability as well as the constraints of logistically putting together all these uh plethora of training activities besides the cost is uh, becoming very um, uh, prohibitive so so therefore and parallelly uh, even as these constraints got imposed advances in electronics in information communication uh, and um, uh, ICT as well as in artificial intelligence machine language uh, and what we have with the augmented reality virtual reality extended reality and with 5g and internet internet of military things coming in soon uh, you have all these tools available uh, to us to be able to kind of make a virtual battle space environment and that is what is being leveraged we see it being done by the private industry in these computer games and so forth we see it Uh, in so much of uh, commercial use today like i am being seen uh, that's a live real thing but the background behind me that's not uh, live uh, that, that that's a different background so it's augmented uh, we keep uh, keep using the uh, uh, google street view that's again augmented reality commercial tools also allow you that before you buy a piece of furniture you can virtually try it out how it fits into your place so all these are just examples of how uh virtual augmented reality is being infused to make training more meaningful and and it's got a uh, uh, good reason to do so in the combat environment as well uh, because one of the cag reports not so long ago had uh, mentioned that about more than 70% of accidents are due to uh, the user errors and lack of adherence to sops and so forth and as far as uh, use of simulators in war gaming and training is concerned the task force in 2018 19 which was constituted to see the use cases for artificial intelligence they had submitted their report to the ministry of defense and this was one of the the use cases that they were identified for good reasons and there are a host of areas uh, where the army navy and the air force are using it whether it is to acquire skills in weapons platforms Uh, giving them night flying environments virtually uh, navigation survival combat situations medicine in combat situations uh, and and you can also inject unplanned unanticipated events in these training you can simulate environments which are so difficult to simulate in real real conditions uh, also this is very important for Uh, not just initial initial level of uh, skill building at the individual level but also for team building uh, these tools are very uh, good um, you can uh, check out the stress levels you can generate uh, the, those kind of stress situations 
Um, you can also incidentally uh, create a virtual electromagnetic spectrum environment to, to try your people and your teams in those situations. And the maintenance repairs and overall uh, extensively being used once again. The good thing is that they are also scalable, they are replicable, they are location and time uh, agnostic. You can conduct it anytime, unlike your, unlike your real uh, environment training, which is upset because of uh, weather, rains, and so forth. Um, equally important is the fact that uh, while you're doing this virtual training, it gives you tools to make it very measurable. There are matrices you can, uh, you can advise, you can straight away promptly give a feedback to the trainee, uh, which is not the same in real situations. And that, that feedback is equally not very objective as well. There's no risk and there's no injury, which is a huge benefit. And finally, very importantly, uh, these are environments where it is safe to fail. When I'm saying so, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, somebody who succeeds wins a match, uh, there is glory without the gore. And uh, even if you lose, th there is defeat without feeling, you know, kind of uh, uh, destroyed. You can, uh, without any inhibition, try out yourself in a situation, which is not the case in real environments. And, and uh, uh, so, so the world over simulated training environment, STE, has become the buzzword. And uh, there is advocacy for a mix of uh, live, virtual and constructive training environments. Constructive is like synthetic reality where the, um, the humans as well as the environment both are uh, simulated. Virtual is like uh, you have the real participants but the environment is virtual. Uh, so a combination of all of that is being tried out all over the world. But the question that we need to answer is that uh, uh, is there a recommended mix what is it that we must continue to do in a live manner? Have we identified those areas where uh, virtual substitution is not possible? These are some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves. And, uh, and particularly so, because you know, even in war gaming, what we do typically is that we try to play uh, uh, even in two-sided controlled and, uh, kind of environments, we try to play those scenarios which maybe do not upset, uh, where the outcomes are not very dis deeply disturbing. So if I may say that the games are fixed, whereas if you were to do it virtually in a two-sided kind of environment, which the computer was to decide based upon rules, etc., we might be surprised with what the kind of, kind of results we get. So if we need to explore it more and more. Another issue I want to flag before we come in the session is that are we thinking of uh, joint simulated environments? Or are we still going to continue along with service silos into training environments, simulated training environments. Um, we will be hearing more about uh, what the Air Force is doing, what the Army is doing, what the Navy is doing. Plenty is being done. ISSA is partnering in a big way. We'll be hearing more about it. Um, CARE is into it. So, uh, and we've got sessions starting off with what's latest in technology in uh, simulators, and then we will be talking talking about uh, what is the R and D effort going into it, and then we'll hear some um, issues of war gaming and land systems, and finally we will close the day with Air Force and Naval simulator systems. So, so this is what is the agenda for today. And without much ado, now let me uh, welcome General T S Narayanan, Pati Vishesh Sevamril, Commandant MC EME. And uh, we're particularly grateful that you've agreed to join us today, sir, despite a very, very short notice and despite the fact that you had other commitments. Uh, we're thankful to, uh, to you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and a very brief introduction for the general would be in order. Uh, he is an uh, alumnus of uh, the technical staff course of higher defense management course commissioned in 1982 long distinguished years of service and uh, he was the deputy commandant and chief instructor of mc amy before taking over the college as commandant he is a specialist in military communications equipment and he has commanded also the simulator development division 
in MCME SDD. And under his uh, able leadership, MCME has won several awards, the prestigious Golden Peacock National Training Award, the AICTE Utkrisht Sansthan Vishwakarma, and the Army Commander Artrax uh, Training Unit Citation. So the floor is yours, sir. Uh, over to you. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, I'll start with uh, A. Marshal Tiwari, Vayu Medal, Deputy Chief of Air Staff, Lieutenant Sunil Srivastava, Ativisa Seva Medal, Mr. Seva Medal Bar, Director, St. Joe's, eminent panelists, ladies and gentlemen. At the very outset, I would like to extend my heartful gratitude to St. Joe's for having invited me to deliver this inaugural address at a seminar which is discussing a very contemporary topic, which is also a compelling need of the hour and needs to be recognized as such and addressed accordingly at the earliest. The eminent and experienced panelists which I see for each session indicate that this seminar is likely to come out with some tangible and practical suggestions and will enable the armed forces to drop valuable lessons and chart out a way ahead for adoption of simulation training for various arms and service of various sister service also. My earlier encounter with the word simulation was at the training academy when as a young GC, I was made to lie down on my stomach on a stool and asked to move my limbs up and, up and down in the air. And after a grueling one hour regimen, when I asked my senior as to what it was, I was told that this was a simulated training for swimming. So I realized very early on that simulated training really works. The later vein apart, simulation as a concept is not new to the armed forces. Manual simulations have probably been in use in some form since mankind first went to war. Although its precise origin can be debated, the game of chess can actually be regarded as a form of a military simulation. In the 19th century, the Prussians game, Kregispil, which appeared around 1800, and is sometimes credited with the Prussian victory in the Franco-Prussian war, war, was distributed to each Prussian regiment, and they were ordered to play it regularly, prompting a visiting German officer to declare that it's not a game at all, it's a training for war. Well, all that is debatable. It's in this late 20th century and this modern era, which has seen simulators and simulation deriving wider meaning and ramification. And why is that? We are all aware of that old maxim that the more you train in peace, the less you bleed in war. In order to keep the armed forces fully prepared for war, men and machine of the three services need to be kept in the highest state of battle readiness at all times. While the machines can be kept battle ready by regular and proper upkeep, men need to train hard to be fully battle ready for the war, which may start any time at short notice. We are all aware that the best method to train would be to use the original equipment or a system in an environment akin to the actual operation. However, over the last few decades, these very training practices stand at a crossroad, facing acute challenges in the form which necessitates the need to adopt radically to new training techniques so that we keep abreast with the training requirements of a fast modernizing army. The challenges which we are facing today are, firstly, the rapidly shrinking training areas and firing ranges due to exponential urbanization and population increase. There is a price to pay in a growing economy and there is no way we can change or slow it down. I still remember when there used to be a vast swathes of land. I mean, as far as I could see, when I used to go for field firing at the margin or Pokhran firing ranges in the 80s. But you go today, and you find that these are developing a small township where in the tea shops and route to MFFR, there's more talk about property rates rather than the firing ranges. This is a reality we are faced with, and we need to find ways and means to overcome this. Second issue is the advent of expensive high technology driven weapons and equipment, which need to be preserved to ensure the longevity in operational service, thereby it, you deprive the force for the, of their availability for training. While modern AI-enabled weapon system and equipment are being increasingly inducted into the army, army, the importance of training the man behind the machine would never diminish. In our effort to preserve equipment, even actual exercise, 
where a handful of tanks or weapon system represent a regiment or a battalion are actually not serving the full purpose of training, training every man for his role. Last but not the least, the omnipresent resource crunch and the ever-reducing share of the defense budget in the total government exp expenditure. I don't want to fight the whites, since that would entail a separate seminar on the subject, but we certainly need to keep these challenges in mind and evolve our training policies accordingly. I have always believed that in every challenge lies an opportunity. The technological advance in the field of simulators have thrown up a plethora of opportunity to leverage this technology to fulfill our training aspirations. In spite of the various challenges I have spoken about, we can still go about using the simulators for our training. While simulators and war gaming solutions have been in the Indian Army for some time, the current challenges to our live training methodologies have necessitated the overwhelming need to broaden the scope of adopting computerized simulation technique to not only own the skills for weapon and equipment, but and also maintenance for soldiers, but also for the operational planning and decision making acumen of our field commanders. One would appreciate that in just a few minutes of a war game, inadequate plans of formation can get exposed since the war gaming software would instantly impose time penalties for a poorly thought out logistics or operational plan. And that brings me to the type of simulations that could be employed for armed forces. This has been covered in the uh, welcome address also, but I thought I'll still go about. Simulation exists in many different forms with varying degrees of realism. The simulations have been universally identified to be three types, that is live, virtual, and constructive. Live simulations are simulations where actual real life players use original system in a real and physical environment, and only the effects of this activity is simulated. These typically involve humans and equipment activity in a setting where they would operate for real. We used to have something called a sim fire, that is simulated fire, which are used by, which was put on a tank T-72 and were used by mechanized forces in full-scale field exercises. For infantry, we used to have one IVS, that is infantry weapon effectiveness simulation system. This was a two-sided collective training exercise where the rear small arms are fitted with eye-safe laser guns and the parchments wear a jacket with laser sensors. These are the examples of live simulation. Virtual simulations, as John Srivastava has clearly said, are simulations involving human or equipment where actual players use simulation system or a computer-generated virtual environment. The running time can be real or in discrete steps, allowing user to concentrate on the key training objective. Examples are a tank gunnery simulator, a small arms training simulator, or a flight simulator would fall in this category, where the trainee uses the simulator system to learn and enhance their skills in handling the equipment based on different operational terrain and environment. A lot of scenarios can be done in the virtual world. The constructive simulations are simulations where virtual players are constructed in a simulation system in a synthetic environment primarily used for training the decision makers. The term is derived from the fact that from a commander's perspective, the pieces operating in the battlefield are not individual soldiers, tanks, vehicle aircraft, but a construction of combination of a group of equipment, personnel, and their capabilities and behavior into a single aggregated entity, like a unit like an infantry company, an artillery battery, all this. They will be similarly pitted against similarly constructed entities representing the opposite side. Often to refer to, these are also called as a war gaming simulation software. Constructive simulations where the theory of warfare and doctrine can be simulated, tested, validated, modified without the need for actual hostilities. The simulation allows commander to face situation and make decision on the stress of time and limited resources, just as they will do during actual combat. So as can be made out, the live virtual simulation primarily aims at perfecting the weapon, equipment, and system handling skills of the trainee, whereas a constructive simulation aim at improving and refining the decision makers' competence as of the commanders and staff officers. There's also concurrent work happening in the field of integrating these three types of simulations. The combination referred to as live virtual constructive integrated architecture, LBCIA, it is what is called, enables entities to interact with one another and conduct a coordinated fight as though they were physically together on the same battleground. Before I conclude, I want to leave you with two thoughts. 
Firstly, the Indian Army has been aware and abreast of these realities, and that is why the Simulator Development Division was established in 1991 at Secretary There are umpteen contexts in which I hear conversation where it is often said that there are a large number of civil firms which are or industries which are manufacturing simulators, and we don't need the SDT. Having been the commandant of SDT till 2012, I do not agree with this thought. I agree that the defense simulator industry is indeed coming up in a big way, and Indian firms are coming up with latest technology in the field of simulators. But like a mutual fund advertisement, the devil lies in the detail. The industry is not ready to share the engineering support planning with EME, and if it even does, the spare availability is not there. The comprehensive annual maintenance contracts are cost prohibitive. The correct model will be that the O and I level maintenance is carried out by EME and the D level by the OEM. In-house development of simulator through SDD would not only entail enhancement of technological threshold of the Indian Army, but will also result in tailor-made simulator for the user and it will be cost effective for the entire life cycle. Upgrades to simulator based on upgradation of the equipment would also come at a fraction of the cost if the simulators could be made in-house. Having said that, I would certainly recommend that in case of high-end simulator, we must procure it from the industry. So, as an overall, for Indian Army, I can say the SDT's design simulator should be primary source for low-cost simulator and the industry for the high-cost simulator. The final concept that I would like to introduce to the August House is the concept of simulator training hubs at the station level rather than the unit level. The present system of giving simulator at the unit level where there is a requirement of trained operator and maintainer increases manifold. Each unit will have to have its own operator and a maintainer. Whereas if you have a simulated training hub at the station level with a suitable organization consisting of qualified manpower and some maintenance person, which will entail a tremendous reduction in the number of actual simulators required and a corresponding reduction in the cost of maintenance of simulator. A training program could be issued at the station level where you did come and train the person as per the training cycle. Unit could be combined in such programs where joint ops or activities have to be also simulated. Establishment of simulator training hub at the station level would prove to be a game changer as far training during peacetime is concerned and would enhance the quality of training manifold. Finally, as you're all aware, the MOD has promulgated a framework for enhanced and synergized utilization of simulator by the three services and the Coast Guard in September this year, which is a welcome step in the right direction. The overarching vision is to transform to simulation-based training across all military domains for combatants, leaders, maintenance, and administrators. And we should achieve cost-effective, efficient, safe, and smart training. The framework will lay, should lay an emphasis on also indigenous design and development, and is indeed an initiative that we need to embrace and adopt as per our present-day requirement. I'm sure that this webinar and the session lined up with the speakers of tremendous experience in the field would serve as very educative and exciting webinar and come out with practical suggestions and ideas which could be implemented in armed forces. I would, to, I would like to once again express my heartfelt gratitude to the organizers for having given me an opportunity to speak about a very relevant and a current topic and one which is close to my heart. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, General Nanayanan, for giving us a historical insight into uh, the simulators as well as the uh, conceptual framework of various technologies and how they are to be leveraged where the world is going. And particularly your two closing observations, wherein you have given a very good suggestion about clear dividing lines uh, with in house captive uh, capabilities being aligned towards meeting the tailor made requirements uh, for meeting the requirements. Uh, of the armed forces, whereas the high end ones should continue to be uh, with the civil industry. I think that's a very, very practical suggestion. Uh, we should be so long as the scales at which the things are required, which the SDD is doing at present, the scales uh, are met as per the requirement. I think it's a very viable proposition. And the other issue about uh, um, simulated training hub. Yeah, about the uh, within the station. Um, Instead of having a disaggregated approach and distributed approach, uh, you, uh, particularly because of the skilled manpower and maintenance issues, 
that once again uh, is a very pragmatic suggestion and a solution. So uh, thank you so much, sir. I think uh, we'll be guided by those observations. Thank you, sir. Thanks, James. Okay. I, I now welcome uh, A. Marshal uh, Namdeshwar Tiwari, uh, Vice in the Middle, Deputy Chief of the Air Staff. Uh, a very brief introduction for the Air Marshal. Um, He's a fighter pilot with over 3,600 hours of experience. And he has been a qualified flying instructor and experimental test pilot. He's commanded Air Force Station Jodhpur and a graduate of Air Command and Staff College, United States of America. And he's also been the directing staff at the Indian Air Force uh, Test Pilot School, as well uh, as an instruction staff at DSSC Wellington. As a test pilot, he has played a pivotal role in the Kargil operations in 1999 and was involved in test uh, in testing of the LCA from 2006 to 9 and has many firsts to his credit. He was a chief test pilot of ASTE and he's also been at the air attache at uh, Paris from 2013 to 16. Uh, he took over as uh, Project Director Flight Test at the National Flight Test Center in October 2018, where he supervised the flight testing for the final operation clearance FOC of LCA. And he's also served as ACAS projects uh, and ACAS plans at the air headquarters. Over to you, uh, Marshal Tiwari. General Shivastav, uh, General Narayanan, General Aroda, uh, and fellow participants. First of all, sir, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak to this uh, august and very knowledgeable gathering. Uh, this is always a pleasure to interact with uh, people on uh, issues of relevance. And the topic chosen today is very, very pertinent since simulators have become uh, a fact of life given the nature of warfare. Especially as I will concentrate more on the aerial domain because that's my expertise. But I can tell you that, uh, especially in, in the for airplanes and all, uh, today we are limited not by the technical capability of aircraft. We are more limited limited by the human capability. And there was a time in the 60s and 70s where just to generate a G. Uh, you were more limited by the structures and the materials available. No more is the concern. We have aircrafts, uh, fighter aircraft is flies to 9G, and it is limited to 9G, though the structures like composites and all are cleared to a much higher level, but that is what the human uh, body can take. So increasingly, we see that uh, we are getting more limited by human capability than a technical capability. And this is where actually simulators come to play a very, very relevant role. The systems on board are getting more and more complex on aircraft. Uh, you have today multiple sensors. They are all fused to give you a picture. AI is generated. So today a pilot in the cockpit is no more worried about takeoff and landing, though it is one of his critical concerns when he's flying. But mission accomplishment depends more on how well he's able to handle systems. Now we know whether you look at a mobile, whether you look at uh, any other more complex, how often you use it, you will get more and more familiar. And as in case with high-end mobiles, there are probably 60% of the features you ne never end up using because either you don't know about it or you don't find it relevant. But in a, for uh, aircraft and platforms, every small bit of information that can be given and that can actually scale up your combat capability is very, very relevant. And therefore, it is important that he continues training. And that training can only happen either if he flies in real time or if that flying is not available to him because of resource issues or because it is uh, so costly then you fall back on the simulator to give you that same capability. So I can tell you that uh, when we joined the Air Force, simulators are nothing new in, in aviation. In fact, in civil aviation, simulators are there for ages. And most of categorization, 
skill training is actually done on simulators and very little on actual aircraft because of the cost involved as well as complexity and even sometimes the danger. Uh, take a case that if you want to a uh, pilot to learn to land in poor visibility. Now, rather than taking up on an actual aircraft and trying to make him land in very, very low visibility, where at times the situation may became, uh, become irretrievable, it is better to teach him on a simulator and you know, scale up his proficiency before he actually goes on the aircraft and flies. And we have seen this time and again that it has made a huge difference. Today, uh, civil airliners, pilots are able to land in 50 meters of visibility is because of all the simulator training that they have done. Not that every time they encounter visibilities of 50 meters in places like, you know, Delhi. So simulators has that importance that it increases safety, it increases proficiency. Enough data exists in the world to say that flight safety has improved tremendously as and when simulators have been improved, uh, introduced. So Indian Air Force started using simulators for aircraft uh, way back in the 70s, actually. So most of them were, of course, uh, bought, especially the MiG-21 simulators came all the way from uh, Russia. But increasingly over a period of time, we have realized that simulators form a very, very essential part of training. And uh, in fact, in the early 80s, we decided at that point that each station, wherever simulators are located, we will post specific instructors and officers to impart training to the pilots and the air crew. And this is important because earlier it was considered, okay, that it is just another job. You go there, you do your own thing, you're not supervised. But in the early 80s, we decided that, no, that is not the way to go. You need a structured approach. You need people to be there who are proficient as instructors who can give them you know, the task that they need to perform, especially when it comes to, you know, things like emergency handling, which cannot be actually replicated on the aircraft. It is very, very important because uh, when you're flying, the time available to you sometimes is very, very critical. Uh, you have to take decisions, uh, decisions in seconds, especially on takeoff or critical phases of approach and landing. Now, in such cases, if an if a emergency was to occur, a technical emergency, and the pilot is not tuned to what action he needs to take. Uh, invariably, when he encounters that in real life, it would be one in maybe thousand hours, but that one situation is, uh, he may not be able to retrieve the situation. Therefore, to prevent that, a lot of emphasis is given for emergency handling in simulators. So it started from that point of view that, you know, bad weather, emergency handling, these are the things we initially worked on the simulator because the initial simulators had limitations. But as uh, the technical complexity has increased and the availability of computers and high-end visuals, that has changed quite a bit. Today, in fact, simulators are as good as a real aircraft, sometimes probably more so. And that is why you find in the civil side, most of the categorization, most of uh, your skill and proficiency training, as well as, uh, you know, evaluation is done on simulators, not on real aircraft. So the Air Force has also now imbibed the same approach. Today, I can tell you with confidence that every contract we sign, every contract we sign comes with inbuilt simulation uh, and simulators as a part of the contract. Now, I agree with General Narayan when he said that you know, the AMC costs are very prohibitive. And sometimes, you know, over a period of time, uh, you have to decide whether you should have developed in-house capability or you need to still outsource. And uh, because there is today a fair amount of uh, expertise available in the civil sector. But what we have realized that initially we did this, but uh, in our later contracts, we find that now we are including AMC as part of the initial capital contract and it is used to determine the L1 vendor. While the AMC contract is signed separately, but the cost is fixed as of now, so that later on after the warranty, when you you know get into an AMC with the vendor, you are not surprised by a new price, which is much more, it's very high or something like that. So that that is the advantage that you can gain. And we find that uh, the, the AMC cost has come down substantially. 
in fact uh, today uh, we just signed recently signed a contract for, for the hal simulator uh, with the hal for simulators for the jaguars and we use the same model we found that you know if you make it since it's a multi vendor situation obviously everyone will try to give it at a at the price that it is most competitive for him not discounting the fact that he of course needs to make a little bit of profit so that is one aspect of it but more importantly uh, if you see for the air force simulators is a way of life now and uh, i think everyone has accepted when we were young pilots we used to think simulator is a waste of time i think no more so uh, every new aircraft new inductions the simulators are in place we try to make sure that the simulators are in place before the actual arrival of the aircraft take a case like the rafale it was contracted right from the word go and in fact before the aircrafts came to india the simulator was set up and we were training our pilots so the advantage which we had which we had was while the initial training happened in france some people came back we continued their proficiency and continuity training on simulators in india so when the final aircraft came and this uh, you know while we stood up the squadron in india uh, we had a composite set of air crew ready to you know take on the operational task and that is why you found that uh, we have inducted the rafal aircraft with all the weapon capability it's one of the fastest inductions in the history of the air force it's very it's been very very quick less than a year's time so that is the advantage a good simulator can give now uh, there are various models available uh, for simulators and we have used practically all kinds of models like uh, there are places like for helicopter training we are using you know uh, outsourced model which we hats off there is a simulator in um, uh, simulator section in bangalore which is used for uh, training our pilots uh, on alh and we take uh, you know certain uh, slots there and we send our pilots regularly instructors are based there uh, in hats off itself and they do the training for our pilots which is uh, one type of model similarly there are other types of model where uh, we have contracts it's a build operate transfer model we have used we have also used build and operate model that means we we don't own the facility uh, it is built by a company and we are paying a per year or per hour user charge guaranteeing a certain number of uh, hours per year for a certain number of years and then we rework on the contract for the next few years after that so that is another model available uh, today uh, just to give you a case that uh, currently we have uh, in the process of upgrading some of our su30 simulators and we had a huge response from indian vendors and there are many vendors who have come forward to say ki we can do the task so i think that capability and capacity in the indian ecosystem is great as far as simulators are concerned and uh, it is the way to go and i'm sure that uh, between the requirements of the service of training and cost efficiency and the requirements of the industry to you know have a viable business model there can be a balance obtained uh, i will give you a case for the uh, lca simulator lca simulator has been designed by drdo and we recently inaugurated it in sulur and and all the people who have flown they they feel that it is one of the best simulators that we have available in the country so that capacity is available even in our you know dpsus hal uh, drdo as well as in the private sector so we have to find a model which works best for us and this is what we feel that i think the capacity agrees that we agree that even in many of the cases like uh, whether aircraft manufacturers or uh, foreign companies i think there is enough capacity in indian companies to take on the uh, business of simulate simulators for such uh, kind of a uh, you know this thing requirements uh, cases where boeing uh, cases like airbus these simulators have been uh, you know formed by third companies which are neither affiliated to airbus or boeing but they are given the data packs and then they set up the simulators and they maintain them for the years to come based on a rate and usage charge so we realize that simulators are very very important and it is there to stay in fact uh, it is a uh, given that at least 20 to 30% of our training is going to happen on simulator because cost wise we see that when, uh, the cost of simulator is one fifth of that of actual 
you know, flying aircraft. So it makes eminent sense for us, especially in the initial stages of training, when our pilots are just uh, starting to graduate to a new aircraft, or uh, you know they have just come out of training academies, and you need to upgrade their skills. So this is the model that the Air Force is going to follow, and every future contract as well as current contracts, we have had many contracts where uh, simulators are inbuilt. Simulators have also come as a part of our offset package. And that's another business model, which many uh, OEMs have set up the simulator and now are being run by Indian companies on a cost basis uh, for which we are paying a per usage cost. So these are various models that are available and all are working well. And uh, I think uh, finally the service will look at what is the most efficient model in terms of cost as well as, you know, reduced footprint and logistical footprint for the, uh, the service itself. So this is, I will stop here and I'm sure that, uh, you know, the, as the sessions progresses, uh, we will have um, more questions and I'm sure many more answers to this uh, fascinating field. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Marshal Tiwari, for these observations. Uh, you've made some very, very interesting ones, uh, uh, not just highlighting the centrality and the early engagement engagement with simulators way back from 1970s. Um, the fact that you said that also like the commercial counterparts, most of your categorization, etc., and evaluations now, uh, simulator based simulators are a way of life. The fact that you said you bundle in the the value of uh, uh, simulators and maintenance as part of the L1 bidding itself at that stage, so that he doesn't slap higher costs later. Uh, very, very pragmatic way to go, as also the other models that you explained. In particular, the fact that about 20 to 30 percent of uh, training being on simulators and uh, the cost being one fifth, uh, it's a very, I think, uh, interesting kind of a, a benchmark that others can take note of. Um, eventually, as you rightly said, the trade offs are between the time, cost, and the outcomes. So it's a balance for how much real, how real training, how much uh, simulator based training. And uh, there are no kind of fixed solutions, and each country decides on its own. And particularly, uh, simulators come in very handy for when the skills fade. If real flying is cost prohibitive, so for the skills not to fade away, uh, I think the Air Force definitely being a, a, a platform uh, centric uh, uh, capability simulators are the way to go. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we we'll now move on to the next speaker. We have now Captain Amit Sood. Uh, he will be talking to us on use of simulators in the Indian Navy. Uh, Amit is uh, handling naval training in the naval headquarters, and he is a MTech in uh, mechanical systems from IIT uh, K. K is what? Kharagpur, Kanpur, Vishwan? Sir, sir, Kharagpur, sir. Kharagpur, okay, fine. He is a graduate of the Naval War, War College, uh, served on board the uh, various ships, INS Trishul as assistant chief officer, uh, and Sarvekshak as senior engineering officer, at Satpura as an engineer officer. And he's also been an instructor at INS Shivaji and the Indian Naval Academy at Ajimala. Over to you, Amit. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, sir. Uh, flag officers, senior officers, officers and delegates. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm presently being posted at Director of Naval Training, who's uh, primarily responsible for uh, training of manpower and making them future ready. Uh, to start with, sir, I would first like to touch upon what is a simulator. Now, simulator is nothing but a machine which is designed to provide realistic imitation of controls and operation of a vehicle, aircraft, or any other complex system uh, which is available to us. Now, over the past years, there has been a significant increase in the number of simulators being inducted by the Navy. The main drivers for this have been the enhancement in the technology, the change in the technology, high cost of operation, which is associated with use of actual assets, and the enhancement in the quality of training by the use of simulators. It is pertinent to understand that the induction of simulators is a continuous process, 
the tenets that guide it are bound to change as the technology advances and the missions of the Navy evolve. And that is true for any service. While the guidelines for the present day may be elaborated, it is necessary that these are monitored over time and modified as the need be. To address the shortfalls associated with the use of simulators and to have a long-term plan, IN has formulated a simulator roadmap, sir. This would facilitate for easy transition from a system in which simulator induction and training is in silos to the one in which it is coordinated and in alignment with the Navy's mission. Now, prior embarking on the procurement of simulators for training, it is essential to undertake the cost benefit analysis, whether it would be fruitful in a long run to uh, tra uh, transition ourselves to a simulator based training. Simulator training provides significant advantage in terms of training, minimal risk of human life and savings in terms of cost, manpower, assets, spares, maintenance and the in, in, uh, instructors. Taking the example of aircraft uh, crew, sir, the total savings accrue to around 75 to 80 percent of the total cost of the training if the training is progressed on actual assets. Most importantly, simulator provides facility to train, prepare and convert available crew into a fully operational and qualified crew with minimal or no risk to life of both the trainee and the trainer. In view of several intangibles that cannot be measured in terms of cost, availability of training simulators certainly proves to be cost effective asset to enable continuous training without loss of personnel and or assets. The simulator not only augments the training efficiency by simulating various emergencies, while other, which otherwise cannot be demonstrated or practiced in actual asset without having the risk factor involved. The high operating and maintenance cost involved with the conduct of physical training on the asset, combined with the limited asset availability and associated risk of simulating emergencies, have gradually shifted the impetus to the use of simulators in the defense forces. Simulators not only allows for failures which cannot be replicated on the asset, but also allows for unlimited usage without any risk to the crew. Having said that, there are inherent, inherent tangible benefits as well. Just to touch upon few, sir. First is the optimization of training time. Now, when the simulation training is integrated with the curriculum, it has potential of optimizing total training time for a course without duplication of effort. Second, enhanced assimilation by the trainees. Simulator training facilitates, uh, uh, if I may say, enhanced comprehension by the trainees with respect to weapon, sensors, machinery that he is expected to operate while he's posted on the asset. Third is the scalability of design. Now, the flexibility to upgrade the system help keep the training on simulators up to date with corresponding upgradations in the live equipment as well. Fourth is the cost effectiveness. Now, simulator training is cost effective as it obviates or reduces the usage of live equipment, asset, ordinance, etc. Safety is an important factor here, sir. Simulator training offers a safe avenue to undertake this training on risk-oriented tasks. Simulator training promotes consistency in procedures towards achieving standardization in quality of training. Modern simulators also have the ability to undertake performance assessment of the trainees and even that of the trainers. Simulator training also enables possibility of certification, which equip trainees to qualify for an assigned job. Uh, while we are overwhelmed with the advantages of simulators, we must understand there are certain limitations also associated the important ones being simulators cannot replace the essence of live environment. Therefore, trainee must undergo some element of live training, barring few cases. Simulators can prove to be cost effective only if training throughput is commensurate with the cost of the simulator. Tendency among the trainees and instructors to be informal during the simulator training may also cause lack of seriousness and impact envisage training outcome. High initial cost inve investment is also an important factor which may act as a prohibitive factor towards uh, channelizing uh, uh, training on simulators. 
Now, various technological uh, challenges are also there, some of them being simulator integration issues, availability of high speed connectivity, and the most important being information security issues, view handling of sensitive data. Now, having spoken about various advantages and limitations of using simulators, I would briefly touch upon the Navy's perspective and uh, the developments on this front. IN has made significant progress in the field of simulator training. It has been ass assessed that a significant number of units are utilizing simulators to the maximum potential with almost nil shortcomings in their utilization philosophy. For example, the ship handling simulator, which is being installed at ND school, that is navigation and direction school, is critical for honing skills of a navigator before he takes on the responsibility of a specialist on board ships. NBC firefighting and damage control simulators in NBCD school has been, bench, has been the benchmark on live domain simulators for training of all naval personnel. However, due to advancement of technology, there has been a continuous demand for simulators in other domains and specializations of training. Now, as far as the classification of ion simulators in the ion is concerned, uh, the majority of the simulators which we use in ion, they operate at individual level with very few addressing requirements at unit or operational level. Just to put uh, facts to figure, uh, the PC-based simulators in the Navy amounts to around 87%, whereas the virtual domain with synthetic environment accounts for around 11%, and live domain presently is only at 2%. Ion undertakes simulator training in the live domain, the virtual domain, and the constructive domain. But Ion is yet to progress major, uh, progress into the combined live virtual and constructive domain, which is called as the LVC domain. Uh, just to conclude, sir, while IN endeavors to upgrade and integrate the simulators available for training, while ironing out the limitations and information security issues by hardening the IT infrastructure, IN is classifying simulators based on training values sought to be derived, which in turn would form the basis for qualitative requirements for procurement and development. IN's roadmap for simulator training and procurement is also aimed at promoting jointness in training along with the other two services so as to reap maximum benefits with minimum investment. Thank you so much, sir. Jai Hind. Yeah, the, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for sharing the uh, Neville, Neville perspective on uh, Simulators, I guess by and large, it is not very different uh, from uh, what we heard from the Air Force in particular as to how to go about training people for emergencies. Um, the numerous, uh, you know, kind of uh, situations exist in both Navy and the Air Force, um, which is quite different from how land forces uh, use their simulators. And uh, you mentioned about 70 to 80 percent saving in training and uh, Yours is basically more computer based, individual training based. Uh, so I take it that for individual training, huge cost savings exist. And you also highlighted very, I think, uh, um, pertinently the limitations. We must take note of the limitations you have mentioned. I think they apply across the board. And of course, we'll be hearing more about it in the sessions to come. So thank you, Amit, for that perspective from the Navy. And uh, I would now request. Uh, Karan K.V. Kubair, uh, Director, Aerospace and Defense, Ernst & Young, to be sharing the industry perspective. But a very brief introduction for uh, uh, Karan Kubair. Uh, he has done uh, the Technical Staff College course and uh, has commanded electronic warfare regiments. He was actively involved in handling electronic warfare issues, both in the Eastern Theater as well as the Northern Theater of uh, India and uh, uh, he has very uniquely contributed to the capital acquisition um, process and programs. He was a director there and he has, I think, pioneered the defense offsets facilitation, uh, felicitation agency, that is DOFA, when it was being set up. He has been a consultant uh, after he shared his uniform, uh, not just with DRDO, but also with a host of, of foreign countries who have been uh, picking his mind 
on issues of offsets. Uh, he also publishes a magazine, Sogosh Advisory, and uh, he's actively engaged with the uh, MSMEs and how more could be done for their promotion. So, thank you so much. Over to you, Khan Kubel. Thank you, sir. Ajahn Srivastav, respected uh, panelists and respected uh, dignitaries who are, who are listening to this talk. So I want to begin with a quote which I just saw on the, you know, a beautiful serial on the Netflix, which is The Imitation. It says, sometimes it is the person who no, one's, no one imagines anything of who do things no one can imagine. So we are going to find the relevance to this particular quote as we go forward. When we will see some of the startups doing uh, some excellent job in this field. And uh, this is uh, how, uh, you know, Turing during the World War II developed a system, uh, as what we call today as computers which actually broke the code of Enigma, which was held as a secret by the, the British government for more than 50 years. Although Turing was, was convicted for uh, uh, things other than um, uh, spying, but uh, yes, uh, there was a royal pardon that was granted later by Queen Elizabeth II. So, uh, this machine type, uh, these type, uh, these type of machines operate on um, infinite memories and um, I was very happy to hear when the deputy chief of the air staff said combat capability is no more limited by the the, the technical and aero capabilities of the machine but uh, by the human capability that operate that and 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 I think that's a very uh, important thing that we need to understand today uh, uh, because I think the machines have gone a little more faster, a little more uh, uh, advanced than what uh, what we can do because they can do it repetitively and they can do it exactly the same manner that uh, is expected out of them. The imagination is all ours. Um, so the military simulation and training market um, is expected to garner something like $20.58 billion by 2030. Uh, this is from an allied market research report. And uh, as I as I read that uh, it is the surge in territorial conflicts worldwide that has led uh, to the growth of defense expenditure, which in turn is contributing to the growth of uh, uh, global military simulation. And North America normally takes the highest share because I think by the way they use um, uh, 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 military technology and military products. And um, with the emergence of COVID-19, as uh, General Srivastava was, main, uh, was mentioning some time ago, um, it, uh, you know, this, this, has, this has picked up a little more in, in, in various other fields. Um, also, the, uh, the, the global, uh, the, the military um, simulation training market in 2020 itself has generated something like $11.56 billion. And as I said, it will uh, it will go up to 20.58 by 2030. Last time when I was speaking on this uh, this particular seminar in the uh, on, on military simulation, we mentioned a figure of $10.2 billion in 2018 with a CAGR of 3.1%. And uh, as far as the Indian Armed Forces are concerned, the Air Force uh, takes the lion's share of 50% and the others, the Army and the Navy, uh, have about 25% each. Now we heard uh, General Narayanan speaking to us from uh, uh, from from MCEME, and he was also, as he said, the commandant of SDD. Uh, in the Indian Armed Forces, we have the SDD, the Simulator uh, Simulator uh, Division in Hyderabad. Uh, we got uh, you know like Captain Amit was talking to us about the WTS Chilka. We have PAI at Rajali. We've got the Milsim at NIAT. Uh, we've got the Pilatus simulator, we've got the MiG-29 simulators, we've got the SU-30, the C-130s, the C-17 simulators. And of course, uh, like uh, uh, Captain Amit did mention about the uh, Abedia, uh, the NBS, uh, NBC, uh, the NBC simulator in INS Shivaji. 
In fact, that was very interesting to see uh, uh, the former chief actually when he inaugurated this, uh, the maiden NBC training facility at Lonavala um, on the occasion of the Platinum Jubilee. Where he, where he he commissioned uh, Avedya and it's one of its training, uh, one of its kind training facility in uh, in, in 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 entire Asia. Um, actually, Avedya means uh, impenetrable and symbolizes the protective cover that is provided on naval ships you know, with uh, with NBC and other protection systems. So uh, this was initiated. This project was initiated in two two zero one six, executed by Goa Shipyard. Um, uh, to provide realistic training to naval personnel in detection, protection, and uh, against contamination of uh, NBC and other agents. So uh, I, I think the the deputy chief also spoke to us, and he said about there is no dearth of Indian companies that are there today, and for uh, for an RFP, they have found. Uh, the, the response has been tremendous, which is which is a very good sign, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So based on the training type, the light training segment uh, holds the highest market share, uh, about two fifths of it, uh, with a CAGR of 7.0. Based on application, the airborne simulation segment holds the largest market share in 2020, about three fifths of the total market share with the airborne simulation segment, uh, with a CAGR of 6.6%. And based on region, of course, North America takes the lion's share. And uh, uh, the leading players uh, of the of the global military simulation and training, um, you know, we have this uh, uh, IAI, Lockheed Martin, CAE, Megat, um, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Rain Metal, Thales. Um, the global flight simulator market itself, uh, you know, is segmented as the FFS. The full flight simulator and the FTD, the full uh, the flight training devices, and others which are the FBS and the FMS. Um, so um, this uh, this if we see our own MOD um, MOD uh, document which has come out on simulators, they they have indicated that um, uh, for uh, for for the fighters we are looking at FTD type of simulators FTD four to six. Uh, for Hepters, we are looking at FTD seven or a minimum FF, FFS level C, which is you know we when we talk of this, we are talking about something like a six axis motion simulator uh, with night and dusk visuals. And uh, for transports, uh, the the document prescribes uh, FSS level C or D. And um, so we are seeing that the global hel helicopter simulator market itself was something like three hundred fifty point five million dollars um in in uh, in 2020 and is expected to reach something like uh, 552 million by end of 2027 with a CAGR of 6.7%. Um in the uh, in the in the the major uh, driving force for this is uh, the, the rising demand by the commercial and, and military pilots as well as uh, the virtual flight training to ensure aviation safety. And this is likely to raise over the next decade uh, with the flight simulator market, uh, taking the flight simulator market forward. Um, due to regular air aircraft model size technology changes, uh, the pilots must continue to train, continue to upgrade themselves. And uh, we have seen what happened with the Boeing 7, uh, 7, 7, 737 MAX. And, and therefore, you know, this is very important that uh, this will carry on. So the requirement of, of simulators is going to be very huge and therefore the industry should be pretty excited. Um, in addition, the increasing investment in the construction of advanced aviation and training organization expected to boost the adoption of flight simulators in the, in the whole thing. Uh, the trends influencing are the exorbitant expense of maintaining an actual aircraft and the growing desire for better uh, effective pilot training, demand for active pilots, increase in the global aviation traffic, um, and the, the flight simulators and uh, should allow pilots in both routine and rarely used abilities. So, so that's another very great advantage which it would have. And... Uh, I think uh, what uh, what is being predicted is that the FFS, the full flight simulator segment, is expected to be the most lucrative. It takes the cake, and uh, also the commercial aircraft segment is expected to be the most lucrative in this. Um, in the in the defense per se, you will have an RFP once in a while here and there, and uh, and and of course, uh, unless the, the simulate if if simulator is the only business, then one should look at both uh, the civil and military, and also look at uh, how we can export the uh, simulator services. 
the economics of military training uh, will actually uh, will, will take you will, will will demand that we take it from the simulator to the field simulator to solo flight and also reduce the cost of ojt which is the on the job training some global examples on this are the blue drop performance learning the small business of the year the semigon uh, which is uh, vr systems for columbus airbase uh, the vd mac uh, which is uh, singapore technologies engineering which is the next generation collective training and like that there are a number of others like sub uh, virtual uh, simulators vr simulators and um, some examples of technologies that were presented are this op flashpoint which is the godfather of uh, uh, all the battlefield simulators, you know, it, it, it starts as a training game and uh, how how gamers are getting into this in a very, very big way. And therefore, uh, what uh, one does not think much about, they are the guys who are going to produce something that we cannot imagine. So we have this Ghost Recon, which is a tag combat simulator and the armored assault with the Bohemia Interactive. Trends depict that uh, out of the total defense revenue expenditure uh, allocated, uh, as far as we are concerned, every year, uh, we spend about uh, four to five percent on training and related activities. As per the projections, the country is anticipated to spend over 20 lakh crores, that's $370 billion, uh, in the next 15 years on revenue procurements alone. Taking this into consideration, we can say in the next 15 years, the country is likely to spend close to about 80,000 crores. Uh, close to 14 odd billion dollars on training and related activities and therefore we deduce what could be the simulator uh, market in this whole thing uh, the uh, the framework for the enhanced and synergized utilization of, of simulators which was promulgated in september 2021 um, it lays down the that it should be indigenous design developed and also uh, also as an outsourcing of operation maintenance uh, for by the indian companies the policy allows all types of simulators and uh, to be procured in future by the armed forces. The deputy chief did speak about that in all the RFPs. They're going to mention this. And today, with the type of capability uh, that is available in the Indian industry, I think uh, I think there would be no other choice but to probably uh, take it as a BFE or a BNE and put it over there in all your RFPs, even if it is a global RFP, that uh, the simulation or the simulator will be developed by the Indian companies. I think this should be a sort of a dictate that should come into the uh, defense acquisition procedure. So the DAP uh, uh, 2020 also highlights uh, that uh, the DAP, uh, the, the preamble, and I give, a, I give a lot of importance to the preamble because it's almost like the preamble to the constitution where, you know, when in, in case of doubt, get back to the the preamble. It says that the DAP focuses on ensuring that contemporary technology based equipment is made available uh, to the services in a time bound manner. And one way to achieve this is by adopting simulation based trials. And we are going to from simulators, we're going to talk about simulation based simulation based trials. And, and therefore, the entire concept of simulation as a enabler to the procurement is going to be a very big, uh, very big uh, uh, market as we go forward. The TPCR 2018 uh, uh, actually gives that the Indian Armed Forces required missile simulators for a uh, anti-tank uh, guided weapons, air-to-air -air missiles, uh, spatial disorientation uh, simulators, and full motion simulators level D. So we talked about these things as given in the uh, in the in the document by the MOD also. And um, just to mention that the uh, the government signed uh, a contract for procurement of two fixed base full motion simulators for Jaguars from HL as the, as the deputy chief was mentioning uh, with a five year CMC a comprehensive annual maintenance contract CMC uh, at a combined cost of about 357 crores. Uh, these simulators would be installed at the Air Force Station Jamnagar and Gorakhpur. And uh, again, this is also mentioned in the in the MOD document that it should be close to the base. Um, a state of art um, M uh, MiG 29K flight simulator was also made operational on INS Dega in September 21. Keltron, a public sector undertaking of Kerala, signed an MOU with the NPOL for developing uh, US HUS, you know, sonar simulators for use on submarines. And uh, this is be this has been a very big hit. Although the CAG had some observations on delays, but I think we are doing very well over there. Uh, earlier this year in April, uh, there was an RFI for at least 20 basic trainer aircrafts for training of pilots. Uh, it also specifies that the airport needs a trainer that can undertake four to six sorties a day 
and uh, it includes a provision provision for uh, simulator for pilots as well. Uh, the DIAT in Girinagar, uh, uh, which is under the DRDO, has a school of robotics uh, with uh, with with also uh, uh, with uh, with advanced workstations in all, in, in installed with uh, high end software and simulators. Um, some of our, um, you know, the the other thing which I I picked up was that um, uh, this Bangalore based uh, Cryk Entertainment. You know, these entertainment companies which are coming with gaming solutions today are uh, into into a very big way in simulators. They have developed the non lethal military simulation sports where which is enabling the users, the gamers um, in the in the CV street to experience an army like environment. And uh, it's focusing on firearm simulation technology and also in talks with Indian armed forces to train their personnel. Uh, they have created tactical arenas. And it took them some uh, some months to design the whole thing to come to the concept. Um, they, have, uh, they have they have they have they have now opened it, and I think they are going in a very big way uh, with the battlefield simulation system that aims to make soldiers smarter and skilled to fight. Uh, from high altitude warfare to desert warfare, with integration to tanks, APCs, and RPG. Uh, Lockheed Martin has got one of the world's uh, largest virtual training system, which is called as a CAT combined uh, arms tactical trainer we should actually get there the idea is to create a uh, uh, i mean they have a training site to support individual infantry up to battle group level with 400 soldiers taking on 17 different software so there are a number of things over there and i think when from uh, from a simulator to a simulation system to holistic simulation i think that's what we are looking at um Consolidation is taking place uh, in some parts of the world by some of these big companies like BAE Systems, uh, which uh, has reached an agreement to purchase the Bohemia Interactive Simulations uh, and, and Orla uh, at Orlando, Florida, which is a software developer specializing in military training simulators. And, uh, you know, this is uh, this is what I call as when you, you put the hardware and software together and have the best of both and then you're capturing the entire market. As far as the internal security scenario is concerned, there are interactive combat training solutions that are being given to soldiers um, and humanitarian workers for better understanding of when it is legal and safe to fire live ammunition in the combat zone. So uh, today with uh, increasing riots across the world and, uh, and and some places where, you know, the police have to use and the law enforcing agents have, to, I think this is a, this is, this is an area that also requires a lot of training and therefore the paramilitary forces uh, would, uh, would, would benefit a lot from such type of simulation. Um, there's a guy who wrote on a Twitter, you know, I visited the military heritage museum in uh, Punta Gorda. Uh, Florida for the first time and uh, with with a VR uh, with a VR enabled simulator you can actually go through some of the battles and uh, see some of the history so we have got some exciting battles the battle of hilly battle of you know some uh, pillora we got number of these battles they could be simulated you know it acts as a motivation for our uh, uh, younger generation the Blue Angels uh, Naval Aviation Flight Demonstration Squadron uh, of the uh, the Marine Corps of the U.S. touched down to the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division for training on the command headquarters um, for a for a naval flight demonstration squad. I mean, this is this is purely to uh, to get into uh, the training of simulation before they went in for uh, the actual uh, air, air air show season in 2022. Uh, we've got uh, some fantastic companies down here like Alpha, you know, which does the BMP2, the Simfire, the MI-17, 29, um, Reiki and training ports for the Air Force, and they've used offsets of the mechanisms in a very, ex very uh, effective manner. We've got Zen, which has come with tax sim simulators, uh, armor combat training simulators, and their tank simulators are a very, very big hit. Um, we've got the STD, I mean, SDD, which uh, the general was mentioning to us, but here is where I have a, a slight, uh, I would say, a very, very small difference of opinion um, with due respect to the general, sir, uh, when the industry, what the industry can do, the, uh, the, the government should not be in a business of doing it. So if the industry today has come up to these levels, I think it's time for us to outsource most of this to the industry and uh, save our own costs. Because the uh, the the innovation is in the industry, the uh, charm is in the industry, the uh, the hunger is in the industry, the greed is in the industry, and uh, so so I think we should we should look at that. I mean, it's just a suggestion. But then yes, STD is doing a great job, and I think if there is a way the industry can support SDD, I think that's also uh, a very nice way of public private partnership. 
So um, getting back to the thing that sometimes it is a person who no one imagines anything of who do things that no one can imagine. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Let's wish our industry all the best in simulation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colonel Kubel, for giving us a very, very detailed insight on uh, what is the global scenario, the kind of uh, CAGR, and uh, which segment is garnering what kind of uh, share of the market. Uh, that's a good insight. And uh, in, in particular, you also uh, seconded the observation made by uh, the Deputy Chief of Air Staff is that our own in, indigenous capabilities are very good. In fact, uh, the LCA uh, simulator that uh, Deputy Chief has mentioned, you also mentioned, uh, it has got a FTD scale level of six, which is the highest that you have. So, and then, and you also mentioned that uh, they've all applied for the Su-30 simulator upgradation, et cetera. Whatever indicators uh, one has gathered, uh, through the inputs uh, given by you, is that uh, the, the capabilities of indigenous uh, indigenous capabilities are very promising, and and uh, you rightly said they need to be incentivized. The issue that you mentioned as to whether uh, services should have in-house uh, simulator building capabilities, like what uh, General Narayanan had mentioned. But what I would say is that uh, so long as uh, the facility is cost competitive, A, B, they can do it in scales, C, they can provide the maintenance support. Uh, well, let me just mention a very small thing. Uh, good that this topic came up, is that when we develop these uh, virtual environments for training, uh, something which is supplement to say live training, room intervention, uh, but most army units are uh, using it. Formations are using room intervention techniques. So that's where that laser detected gun uh, detection system, it fires back. But it's surprising that those you know, crumbling pellets, uh, powdered pellets that crumble on impact, but they don't injure anybody. When you try to go to the market to get them, I was coming on OT again just a year back, and we ran into an issue that we were not able to get those pellets here. So what I'm saying is that whenever we make these systems, uh, which in a way supplement either through live virtual or uh, um, you know constructive ways, we must look at the entire ecosystem. Uh, cost competitiveness is a must. So thank you so much, uh, Colonel Kubel, and thank you also for giving us such very useful insights on the recently given out MOD policy uh, of September.